name is Warren Palmer, and I'm the Albert H. Neese Professor of Economics, and it's my pleasure to organize the Upton Forum. This is my fourth year doing it, and every year I'm uh, worried, oh, am I going to do such a good job uh, recruiting an audience that we will have standing room only and people will be stuck out in the hall? And, uh, I don't know whether that was a hope or a fear, but uh, this year it's come true. Uh, we uh, have one empty seat right here that someone can come down and show. Otherwise, we're quite full. <laughs> well, welcome all of you uh, to tonight's very exciting program. The theme of this year's Miller Upton Forum is Energy and the Wealth of Nations. The Miller Upton Forum has the overarching theme of the wealth and well-being of nations. And for 10 years, we have been bringing in one of the top scholars each year who has worked in this field, along with other scholars, to explore what are the things that promote and impede uh, the wealth and well-being of nations. Uh, our theme this year, Energy and the Wealth of Nations, is uh, related to a triple challenge. Ending poverty, reducing pollution, and limiting climate change are three of the greatest challenges facing humanity today. These three challenges are tightly linked together, and all three depend upon humanity's use of commercial inanimate energy. Each year we have uh, an Upton Scholar who comes to campus for a uh, three or four day residency, and this year our Upton Scholar is Michael Greenstone, and he has focused his career on this triple challenge. He served as the chief economist for President Obama's Council of Economic Advisors and is one of the world's most innovative environmental economists. He is the Milton Friedman Professor in Economics at the University of Chicago, where he is also the director of the Energy Policy Institute, the Energy and Environment Lab at the University of Chicago Urban Labs, and the Becker Friedman Institute for Research and uh, Economics. Uh, tonight, we, he is joined by our, in our first panel discussion uh, by three uh, very, very interesting speakers who are going to give their particular uh, viewpoint on the following topic. So I gave them the title and said, uh, prepare remarks any way you like from the title. So the title is, Scaling Low Carbon Energy for the Developing and Developed World. Um, our three speakers in order will be Anu Hittel, a policy researcher for the state of Hawaii's Department of Land and Natural Resources. She's an 86 graduate of Beloit College and is an alumna of the East-West Center. She researches global negotiations on climate change including state-level climate policy. She had a live stream, stream TV series called Climate Change Beyond Outrage, which was a response to help her students at Washington University in St. Louis find their place within the climate change community. Our second speaker, also a graduate of Beloit College, Eric Isaacs, is Executive Vice President for Research, Innovation, and National Laboratories at the University of Chicago. Previously, he had been the Director of Argonne National Lab from 2009 to 2014. He also is a physicist uh, who's an expert on battery technology. Our third speaker tonight is Andrew Refkin, Senior Reporter for Climate and Related Issues at ProPublica which he joined after 21 years of writing for the New York Times, most recently through his Dot Earth blog for the opinion section, and six years teaching at Pace University. Uh, uh, Andrew Refkin has won most of the top awards in science journalism along with the Guggenheim Fellowship, Columbia University's John Chancellor Award, 
for sustained journalistic excellence and an investigative reporters and editors award. The way the evening will work is our three speakers will come up in turn, um, deliver their remarks, and then we'll invite our Miller Upton scholar, uh, Michael Greenstone, to respond to their remarks. And after that, we'll then have our uh, panelists come up, uh, sit in front, and answer any questions uh, that you might have. Um, so if we can begin. Anu. Hi, everyone. How's everyone doing? Good. Good? All right. Awesome. Okay. So, thank you very much for having me here. Thank you, Beloit College, Miller Upton Forum, Professor Palmer. And I also wanted to say hi to my professor, Jeff Adams, who I took econo uh, econometrics and money and banking with many, many years ago. Those things still remain a mystery to me. So, so it, they, they keep trying to push me into this economics box, and they thought by inviting me here, they would uh, have me talk about economics. Well, ha, guess what? So, <laughs> so my friends on the mainland think that just because um, I live in Hawaii, that I live in paradise. They think that we're on a permanent vacation, just catching waves, drinking Mai Tais, and swinging our hips. <laughs> Those words are actually from The Descendants, uh, a movie that starred George Clooney, and those were his words, his opening words. And then he went on to describe a few things about Hawaii, which uh, weren't so good. And I'll sort of diverge here and take my own take on it and talk to you about the energy-related issues there. It does have the highest per capita rate of homelessness in the nation. So you can see in the background uh, the sort of skyline, if you will, of Honolulu. And then in the front, uh, in the foreground, are the, the t tent cities of people who are homeless. Um, and so it has problems of homelessness. And according to Hawaiians, also, or Hawaii residents, uh, the highest ele electricity rates, which they think is a problem, and of course, for economists and for conservationists, this might be slightly different. So um, by highest electricity rate, so we're talking two to three times the national average. So um, if you can see, like back in 2013, uh, it was actually three times, and now it's about two times the national average. So in Wisconsin, for example, you pay about 15 cents a kilowatt hour. In Hawaii, we pay 30 cents a kilowatt hour. In places like Illinois, about seven cents. Okay, so it is two to three times. So yay, we're first, you know, on, on Hawaii electricity rates, but I'll tell you why that's a yay a little later. Okay, so um, I'm plugged into the global efforts. I observe these efforts. I don't actually do anything. I observe, analyze, and report. Um, and that's uh, with the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which was uh, signed in 1992. There have been a conference of the parties every single year. That is, the high ministerial level governments get together and they decide what to do about climate change, so it's a very slow moving beast. Um, you might have heard of the Paris Agreement, signed in 2015 by 197 nations, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, the, and then what was important about the Paris Agreement was that every nation came up with their voluntary pledges. Okay? So the US pledged this, whatever this thing means, the 26 to 28 percent cuts. Sorry if you were in Obama's administration. Uh, Michael, but you know, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna rip that apart a little bit later. Cuts over 2005 levels by 2025. Um, so we'll talk about that a little later. This is just some of the students that I used to take to um, to those uh, cops every year. So um, I live in Hawaii, and um, I got interested in several questions dealing with how to link these global negotiations with state level work. Um, so that's my day job, is working for the state of Hawaii. And um, uh, one of the things after the last election, when and now we know that uh, the president is interested in withdrawing the US from the, uh, from the Paris Agreement, which he can't really do until four years from when it was signed, so it'll be a little while, but he can do it. And anyway, it's sort of a toothless agreement, so what does it mean, et cetera. But what it got me thinking about was, 
um, a few things here. Is what is Hawaii doing to transition to clean energy? So regardless of the Paris Agreement, what is happening at the state level in terms of transitioning? How do Hawaii's efforts fit into that volunteer pledge that the US made in Paris? And what can a small island state like Hawaii teach us about that transition? So these are the questions that I've gotten interested in, and I'll see how fast I can go so that Warren won't be sitting there intimidating me. Um, <laughs> Okay, so Hawaii is, what well, they're, they're saying it's the most fossil fuel dependent state in the nation. If you just look at, um, on the, sorry it's a little blurry, it's from the State Energy Office, which might explain why. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> they're gonna kill me, are you recording this? Oops. <laughs> oh wow. Okay, so um, maybe it'll induce them to give me a better picture next time. All right, so, um, on the, on the left is Hawaii, and on the right is the U.S., and if you can just see that big blue thing, that's all oil, and we import oil, and that's how much uh, Hawaii's electricity production is about seven quarter, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> three quarters um, from oil, and if you can see on the U.S. side, it's just a little sliver, right? So Hawaii imports oil and coal, actually, um, and so that's, that's one of Hawaii's issues. Um, it also... Um, there's a lot going on in this slide, but what I want you to focus on is that the, is the, the writing on that um, top left, which is that it's divided pretty equally, a third electricity, a third air transport, and a third ground and marine. So that's about how it's divided up. Um, and um, in general, Hawaii is trying to do something with electric power and with its power sector. <laughs> Uh, goals and it's got goals for ground transportation, which are a little weak, quite a bit weaker than the electric sector. And then aviation is uh, is the big elephant in the room. So they haven't actually started conversations about aviation. When I started writing this paper, I asked them about aviation and. Uh, Okay, so I don't have any slides on aviation. So um, this is just a little wind farm in Maui. But um, what is Hawaii doing to transition? Um, all right, so it's with high electricity prices, you know, you would think, uh, I mean, that's sort of an economist's dream. You can kind of, it's, a, it's a, a staging ground and a, a way of experimenting, like what happens if I do this to the price, you know? And so with such high prices, I mean, Hawaii has thought twice about um, uh, importing all that oil. And so it's actually doing quite a bit. Um, so it's the first state, to set some kind of a uh, legal deadline to produce 100% clean energy by 2045. So this is called the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative, if you're interested, that's the state office. Okay, so um, <laughs> it's, um, it did this initiative back in 2008. So this was before the Paris Agreement, very, very interesting. Since 2001, they've, been, uh, they've done solar incentives for solar and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but here's another place where it's number one. In 2015, it was number one in the nation for, nation for solar per capita, and that's distributed, which means uh, all over the place, right? And then, um, so solar energy generates about 35% of Hawaii's renewable electricity. Most of it is actually generated by wind. And that's, I'm counting both utility scale and, and distributed um, electricity. So, um, what can the small island state do and, and teach us about this transition to renewable energy? Um, it obviously has a lot to gain from this, making this transition. And, um, you know, it, one, of, one of the things, of course, is um, they had this, in 2001, they started this uh, net metering program where if you collect, if you have solar on your rooftop, you can then feed it back to your utility at retail rate. So they were getting retail rates for solar um, electricity, so consumers like you could get retail rate. And in Hawaii, of course, if it's 30 cents uh, you know, per kilowatt hour, you can really basically generate a lot of uh, uh, electricity for free, right? So, um, so, so that was an interesting incentive. It ended in 2015 because the electric, electric utility said, please, <laughs> stop. <laughs> Um, you know, the, it, there was a bottleneck, essentially. They didn't know what to do with so much solar coming in, right? So it's a really interesting lesson with incentives, too many incentives too soon. Um, now they've stopped it, the permits, uh, requests for permits have gone down, so that it sort of got this boom and bust cycle going. So, you know, what's, what's going on? Uh, I mean, it's a really interesting test case. 
if there are other states that are thinking of doing this, you know, obviously you've got to get the incentives right as well as the price, right? So the other thing is what will the utility of the future look like? So if you've got a utility that's buying from consumers instead of giving or selling to consumers, what's that going to look like? Is that going to make any sense? Um, will it have a different role? So that's a conversation they're starting to have in Hawaii. Um, and then, of course, there's this lesson of prices, right? So um, you've got the, the high prices, and what, what can it do um, in general to the economy? So, so here, you know, if you're talking about prices, let me just transition over to, to this side of things. This is the view from my, uh, from my, essentially my street. When I go running in the morning at 6.30, you can see the lights are green, but all the brake lights are on. So there's a traffic jam on this highway every single day. It starts at six in the morning. And um, it's one person per car. Same story everywhere, and in Hawaii even more so. So it's a real good test case, right? Um, there are some HOV lanes and so on, but then you get a bottleneck at the other end. So, so you know, cars, ground transportation, that's a huge one, and this was just some, you know, cute little statistics, I thought. I mean, they don't, there's, there are different ways to spin this, but um, Hawaii is sort of in the middle for the number of cars per thousand people, so it's not like we have, you know, hundreds of cars per person. Um, but really, um, so if you're looking at uh, talking about prices, now if you actually had the same kind of price differential for gasoline, what would that look like over here? What would that tra traffic jam look like? So right now, I thought I took this from Bloomberg uh, in August. Um, the price of gas, it sort of said this banner, the US loses spot in top 10 countries for cheapest gasoline, like it was something to boast about, right? So we're, we're 11th in the, in, the, in the world for um, what we charge for gasoline. According to Bloomberg, Venezuela considers uh, gasoline a, um, a basic human right, and they uh, charge a cent a gallon. Um, so basically free gasoline for everyone. Um, okay, so right now, Hawaii is about 50 cents per gallon higher. So that makes it $3 a gallon, right? If it were twice, like the electric rates, if it were twice that, so if it were $5 a gallon, or if it were three times, so seven fifty, yeah? So you're looking at something like where Norway has the highest, and that's $7 a gallon. This is a country that has oil, right? <laughs> but what do they do with it? They actually save the money that they get from it. Amazing. Okay, so um, now Norway is trying to, it's got the largest EV, the electric vehicle fleet in the world. It's 5% of its current fleet. Their plan is by, 100, by um, 2025 to make it 100%. So Hawaii is talking about electric vehicles as well. And right now, Hawaii is at less than a percent of the total fleet. And plus, you have to ask the question of how are these, these vehicles charged? I mean, are you charging them with that oil that you're importing? Or is it going to be with solar or, you know, or what? So there, that's the conversation that's happening, okay? So um, Norway, by the way, does it, plans to do most of it with um, hydroelectric power. So they're not doing it with the oil that they have. Um, so this is an interesting, you know, like, the reason I put this out there is with the highest oil prices, and the most aggressive EV plan in the world, this is what, it is achievable, it'll be done by 2025, Norwegians seem to you know, be able to achieve these things. Um, and you know, those are, those are Hawaii statistics, so I don't know, maybe we need to increase the price of gas, because guess what, once you have EVs in Hawaii, it's still gonna be one person, one car, and I'm still gonna have that traffic jam, right? So we're really looking at trying to get away from that one person, one car. It's not even emissions at this point. Okay, so um, I could keep talking about the traffic jams forever because I deal with them, but um, I ride the bus, so. Okay, so, <laughs> all right, so um, how do Hawaii's efforts fit into the US's pledges? Um, and so here is what the pledge is, okay? I call it Pledge de Paris because I don't really know any French, so I thought that sounded fancy. Okay, so um, it's so on the on the y-axis is your um, emissions as a percentage of 2005 levels because that's what the U.S. said it was going to pledge 2005 levels. 
you can, and then um, you can see this is this is actually the historic the historical data, the the blue up to the blue line. So it's sort of you can see it actually started up pretty high. Um, well, it started at the 100% because that's the 2005 level, and then you can see it went, did a sharp drop, and anyway, it was declining, right? So remember, they made the pledge in 2015. So they already looked at the highest point, and every country does that. You know, I mean, why would you go at the lowest point? You'd have to actually do something then. But you know, so, so you start at the highest point, and then you go, you look at, okay, this is achievable, and then you say, okay, we're going to go to, um, and that 73% down there, that circle, by the way, that's, um, that's your, uh, the cut. So it's the 26 to 28% reductions over 2005 levels. So it's, I took the middle point, which is 27%, and so if you, if you turn that around, that's 73%, so it'll be 73% of 2005, and then you go uh, up to 2025. So we did a really simple model, and basically just projected out what that would look like and when that would happen and so on. So that's, that's the, just annualized the cuts, okay? We, it, just, it just kind of went real simple. So then we did the same thing with Hawaii. Um, and um, so there are dips in 2008, you know, economy tanking, Hawaii had a big um, uh, fall in um, tourism, which is a big industry. Um, so aviation emissions, etc. So, um, but then you can see everything is still declining. You're looking at for the U.S. natural ga uh, natural gas and the shift to that. Um, but you can see that Hawaii is already sort of starting out winning the race. Okay, yay! So here we I, we just modeled out the power sector and its goals for the power sector. So. Uh, 2018, mark your calendars, December 31st, if you want to be in Hawaii, we'll be partying because that's when my model says that we'll, we'll be beating the Paris Pledge. Okay? So, um, <clears throat> then we went further and did... Um, oh, this one didn't come out so well. Okay, anyway. Um, did just the power sector and Hawaii's ground transport, if we looked at their goals, and the green line is the ground transport. So, drawing a line down from that, you know, like, uh, that basically says in... Um, 2017, I guess this hasn't showed up that well. Um, that's when we would meet it if we were actually 2018, if we were actually doing anything about it. So, um, so that's your pledge, and that's how Hawaii has, um, with its um, with its goals, that's what it looks like for the Paris uh, Agreement. Um, so, what can a small island state do, and what it basically can do? is I feel what we're doing is awakening ambition. We're ratcheting up the ambition for big states like California, New York. These, these states have got huge economies, right? I mean, California is what, like sixth largest economy or something in the world. You know, so they, their goal is 50% clean energy by 2030. Um, for New York, you know, it's, uh, they've got something like decreased carbon emissions by 80% by 2050. So, but even a state like Hawaii can say, hey, we're actually doing better than you. Do you think you could, you know, do a little better? So there is actually a little climate alliance of states, 15 states that have gotten together, and they are um, pursuing climate goals, mitigation and adaptation goals. And um, I think that one of the things I'll be looking at in the future, and I would love to have a Beloit College student working with me on this, would be to see how each of these states is doing. Uh, in relation to the Paris Pledge, because now it really is going to be at the state level uh, as to what we can do. And um, we'll be, you know, hopefully create some kind of a visible scorecard, a scoreboard for these goals to be shown, maybe put it up on a website and say, hey, such and so is winning, such and so is not, yeah, ha, come on, hurry up, you know, that kind of thing. So I'd love to have a Bullock College student working on that. Um, and um, if you're interested, you know, in more, <coughs> Finding out more, watch the movie, I mean, read the paper. And this is, you know, in order of appearance, the sources, if you're interested, but I'm going to go back really quickly from there and say thank you to the um, Hawaii's Energy Policy Forum, which is a group of people who have been getting together talking about all these issues. They've encouraged me to give a presentation at their um, meetings to talk about, get them started talking about aviation. Um, and, of course, uh, the State Energy Office, Bullwhite College's Miller Upton Forum, and Alexander Hiddle, who, is, uh, who helped me set up the models as well. So, thank you very much.
too, would like to thank you for having us here. It's great to be back at Beloit. I graduated a couple years ago in 1979. And, and I, I, you know, I really, I need to acknowledge, uh, I'm, by the way, I'm the token physicist up here, so I am going to talk about some science. I will teach some science, mostly for Professor Dave Dobson, the emeritus professor here, who was my professor back in 19, starting in 75 through 79, and actually taught a course on energy. I had no idea what energy was about. And, since then, I've been quite involved in energy, so I, I owe you, Dave, quite a bit. So, thank you. Um, so, part of the, the exercise in getting ready for this uh, forum was to read a, an article, I think, that you sent around by Bill Gates. And Bill Gates um, wrote an article about energy miracles. And I really have to be honest that when I first heard the term energy miracles, I got really annoyed because I'm a scientist, um, you know, new ter and, and I know very well that new technologies have nothing to do with miracles. They're not miraculous at all. Uh, they don't drop out of heaven into the laps of scientists and engineers. Uh, most of them, uh, you know, as a scientist, to call technologies miracles is, is really dismissive of the amount of work, the decades of research, the decades of work, some, many of it starting in the 70s that's gone into some of what you even heard in, in, in your last talk here. So I started thinking about, about miracles, uh, and I actually came up with one of my favorite quotes. I used to read a lot of science fiction. I used to read Arthur C. Clarke. And he actually, he was a futurist as well as a science fiction writer. And he actually wrote, any sufficient advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And since he's kind of a hero of mine, um, I guess for the purposes of the conversation today, I'm going to use the word miracles, because I think it's OK, because it is, it is kind of magic sometimes. And even though that I know that the creation of, of, these, um, of, of, of these kinds of miracles are not divine intervention, and as you'll see, are really a, a lot of hard work for many, many years, uh, these, make, these technologies sometimes do seem miraculous, so I think it's important to keep that in mind. I also want to use another, uh, another quote from, uh, from an old song lyric from a, a famous musical by Rodgers and Hammerstein, where they quoted as saying, a hundred billion miracles are happening every day. And that wasn't about love, actually. That was about the miracles of life, the miracles of biology, the miracles of all these great things around. So, okay, we'll use miracles. And when I think about energy miracles, um, that have occurred in my lifetime, and I'm turning 60 on Sunday. Um, it's it's really remarkable, um, you know, that you look at the, the numbers, 100 million. That number actually is, sounds a little small because the number of things that have gone on in the last 40 years are really quite remarkable. And so I'd like to talk a little bit about it. And for example, when I was an undergraduate here, and and Dave remembers as well, the biggest thing that we were worried about was the fear that we'd run out of fossil fuel. It was a crisis with oil and. There were literally lines at every pump. It was a really remarkable time period. Um, the United States, uh, at the time, this is before Three Mile Island, was thinking the biggest growth area would be nuclear power. This was in the 70s. Um, the, the wind energy was, and solar energy were really just a blip. Most people thought solar energy was about heating water. They had no idea that it was going to become what it could be today. In fact, I remember an article, which I pulled back up again, a 1977 Nature article, which showed a very cutting edge technology in wind turbines, which was a two kilowatt wind turbine. Now we have wind turbines that are hundreds or thousands of times, one turbine that are hundreds or thousands of times more powerful. So technology has come a remarkably long way. Uh, and, and, uh, and thinking about it 40 years later, which is really on a geological time scale, which is what you have to worry about when you worry about carbon, it's like a nano blink, as you can say. It's really just a very little time, and a lot has happened. I mean, so for example, just two weeks ago, a group announced that they had built a solar cell that boasts 45% efficiency. So that's more than a factor of two more efficient than anything you could buy today, even at the highest costs. That would transform the industry. It would drive the price down and increase the usage of solar. There are now, in another example, 82 gigawatts, 82 gigawatts of utility scale installations in the U.S. alone um, in, uh, in, uh, in wind energy and just 8.2 gigawatts added last year alone. It's a 10% increase. So no matter what anyone says, this is, this is an engine that's going and growing and, and going fast. Um, and there's also another gigawatt, by the way, I should mention, in distributed solar and wind in, in small farms and small manufacturing, et cetera. And just as importantly, uh, there are revolutionary new technologies uh, that you can refer to as energy miracles, which are in the side of energy storage. And I'll talk a little bit more about energy storage. It's a critical technology for both uh, transportation and the grid, to conclude solar and wind on the grid. Um, and as of June 2016, so it's a little data now, U.S. had over 22 gigawatts rated power in energy storage. That number has gone up a lot. So it's 21 gigawatts just in batteries sitting on the grid to help 
store uh, solar and wind when they're blowing or when the sun's out for when it's not to make it available. Um, and in fact, there are plans now underway in LA to build a, uh, a 100 megawatt, 100 megawatt uh, battery energy storage farm, which would replace a natural gas plant. Natural gas plants are used, it's called peaker uses. They're used basically to supply energy when it's really needed, something you can turn on fast. Nuclear plants are not easy to turn on. You can't turn them off and on. So there'll be batteries that will do the same thing, and this is happening in the next couple of years. So worldwide, there are a lot of miracles as well, just some numbers. Uh, solar accounted for about half of the world's new capacity last year. Half of the growth is, is coming from solar. Millions of units are installed, and nearly 500 gigawatts of wind power are, have been installed in 90 countries, including nine with more than 10,000 or 10 gigawatts. So that's a tremendous amount going in. It's, it's unstoppable. And many of you may know that there was an experiment, done, or not experiment, an actual event where Denmark uh, ran purely on, uh, on wind power for a full day. So they didn't have to rely on coal, they didn't have to rely on any other kinds of power for a full day. And so these kinds of grid level projects are really remarkable. Uh, globally, uh, installed energy storage accounts for about 150 gigawatts. That's a huge number. US, I told you, it was about something like 30, 20, 30 gigawatts. It's about 150 gigawatts. Japan, 15% of all delivered electric power is cycled through a storage facility. So these are remarkable, you could call them miracles, but they're also remarkable as a result of, of the kind of things that are going on. Um, so it's really great news that since 2010, more than 25 million off-grid solar systems uh, have sold worldwide, and the highest, and maybe Andy will talk about it, are in sub-Saharan Africa. The, the largest growth in, in small solar, these are almost <coughs> personal solar devices, are in sub-Saharan Africa. They lend, they, they lend solar lanterns, there are small systems that can be used for lighting, radios, television, very small scale, and that's another huge growth area. And you know, so I guess a lot of people, getting back to this concept of miracles, would call this a real miracle. These are real things that are happening. They're happening around the world, and they seem unstoppable. But the real challenge, and this slide actually shows you the challenge. There's no words on this slide, but if you look at this, you can, you can get a sense of the challenge. It was a term coined by a Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, Rick Smalley, and he called this the 50 terawatt problem. And basically, that you can do some projections out to the year 2100, and by estimates, it looks like we will be consuming 50 terawatts of electricity by the year 2100. Right now, we consume about a third of that. This country consuming a quarter, roughly a quarter of that. But 50 terawatts, and the reason you can, you can just see by looking at this chart, this is not, of course, taken all at once. This is a, a set of photos taken of the Earth at night at all times. You can see there are a lot of dark regions on Earth. Look at China, look at Africa, and those are all developing nations. So this idea that we've solved the problem uh, is, is very clear here that we're orders of magnitude away from, from really solving this problem. So the good news is that in 2016, um, th there has been a, a, a halt to the growth in carbon production. So we can talk about all the energy we're using, the 15, 16, 17, 18 terawatts, but the last three years actually have seen a flattening of the amount of carbon produced around the world. And it raises the possibility that increasing the deployment of renewable energy across the world could decouple, this is something that, that our, our fellow here will have to talk about, could decouple economic issues from the actual energy production issues. If you could actually think about bringing in solar, bringing in wind, you could imagine that. And until recently, everyone thought that increasing pollution necessarily went in hand with economic. You know, there are many charts out there that show linear growth in GNP drives a linear growth in, uh, in, or growth in GNP drives a linear growth in the amount of carbon consumed. And the question really is, can we find a way to disrupt that ongoing march? And what I'm telling you here is that there are probably miracles in the store that will help to break that. Uh, but there's also bad news, and, uh, and we still, this right now, in this current situation, we're producing about 32 gigatons of carbon a year. So this is, this is the, the number. So what does that mean, 32 gigatons? It's a huge number. If you look at what's naturally in the atmosphere, what's naturally around the Earth comes from you know, the ventilation of animals and, and, and plants alike, it's about 750 gigatons. So that's every year we're putting out a 5% addition to what's out in the atmosphere that's already out there. So as some of my colleagues would tell you, we don't know what's going to happen. We're starting to see effects, but it's an experiment. We've got one, we don't have a control sample, it's an experiment. And we're putting out 5% of carbon every year. So that's unfortunately the bad news. And solving this is going to take some really dramatic improvements in energy technologies. 
So what I'd like to talk about, and the energy miracle, miracles that Gates talks about are very important. I don't dispute them, but they're going to take a lot of hard work, and it's really going to be a miracle worker, or as I like to call miracle workers, scientists and engineers, to come up with the technologies that are efficient, effective, that can decouple economics and, 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 uh, and, and this kind of thing. So what I'd like to do is take a few examples and, uh, and look at one in particular, which to me, when I first started understanding this, was surprising, and that's electric vehicles. Because a lot of people think, let's just electrify the fleet. That's a great idea. Uh, by electrifying the fleet, uh, you know, it, it can be a cornerstone. In fact, in the US, it's, it's estimated if you could electrify the whole fleet, including trucks, cars, you reduce the carbon by up to a third, so that's a big change. And you reduce our consumption of oil by a quarter. So those are big changes in, in actual numbers. Um, and, uh, and, and that's a good thing. And in fact, in this country, last year alone, EV sales jumped 37%. Globally, EV sales were strong. Uh, 800,000 EVs were sold last year alone. Uh, that's all good news. That's great news. People really are starting to think about buying electric vehicles. They're making the conversion. But you have to look a little deeper, and I think this is one of the key points of my whole talk. You have to look a little deeper than just say, let's all switch to electric vehicles. And so let me give you a few examples. The environment impacts of EVs, if we think they're zero, they're not. Because remember, at night, you have to plug the EV into the grid. So if you're in California and you plug your electric vehicle in, California's a pretty good state for alternative energy. You plug it in, you have 25% solar and wind, you've got 10% nuclear, you've got a lot of natural gas and very little coal. It's a net win. If you happen to be in West Virginia, it's actually a terrible thing because West Virginia is more than 90% coal-powered grid. So you're, you're using electricity that's been generated with coal. So it's not so simple as saying, let's all go electric. You have to really think about it. Now let's take China. This is about global. Let's take China. China is where coal is used to generate about two-thirds of their power. They're very conscious of alternative energy, but they're using two-thirds today. It's the world's largest auto market. They've announced an ambitious goal to shift a large percentage of their fleet, I don't remember the exact number, maybe Michael does, of EVs. They want to build 10 million EVs over the next five years. They want to plug those into the grid, but they're two-thirds coal. And so that will have one positive effect. There'll be less soot in the air. And if you've ever been to Beijing, you will know what Beijing is like. It's, it's very sooty. So you reduce the soot, but you're not going to reduce the carbon. You actually produce more carbon by using a grid that's heavy and rich in coal than you would if you just had an internal combustion engine, especially with internal combustion engines getting more efficient. The other fact is that um, China announced January that they, they, China has, by the way, a large percentage of coal plants. They have announced that they're, they're cutting out 100 future coal plants and they're going to replace it with nuclear in other ways. So that's all good. But at the same time, nation, sorry, globally, we're looking at 1,600 new coal plants coming online in the next few years alone. So globally, one could argue electric vehicles are a bad thing at the current time with the current mix on the grid. So EVs would actually be a bad thing, frankly, right now. If, if all 1,600 coal plants are built, that would mean the coal-fired power capacity in the world is 43% of our electricity. Not a good thing to have electric vehicles. So it's a little bit of a surprise result. So it's great to own a Tesla. We are talking about Teslas before. But it's, you've got to be in the right state to own a Tesla. I don't know about the why, so you have to figure out in Hawaii what it's like. You know, when I was, when I was a, a younger scientist, when I was working with Dave Dobson and just learning about energy, I never would have thought about some of these other issues. But, but you know, it, you, when you're thinking about building a car that goes 400 miles, you want to build a great battery that goes 400 miles, as a scientist, you're thinking, I can do it. I can, buy it. I can, I can build it smaller, faster, cheaper. And it's really a dream to, to power all these electric vehicles and cars. But it's actually not always the right thing to do. And so I wanted to just show you one slide, which I think is very powerful in this regard. And it shows you two things. One is uh, scientists can't, and engineers, you know, when I was young, I thought faster, smaller, cheaper was the answer. Uh, and in fact, it's not. You have to think carefully. You have to have scientists working with engineers, working with economists, and working with people who do systems level analysis. What this grid tells you is that um, this is a comparison of different types of vehicles on different types of grids. And so, so the top is just gasoline, roughly gasoline today. This is getting better. So this shows how many grams of carbon is produced per kilometer of driving a car. So if you drive a standard internal combustion engine car, I, I have a small BMW, you drive that a kilometer, you generate a half a kilo of carbon. That's a lot of carbon. That's what you get. Most of what comes out is carbon. Some of it's energy, some is carbon. And you go down this list, and I made this point before, California, because of the grid mix, looks really good. It's about half 
the amount of in, the amount of energy, half the amount of carbon produced than an electric than, a, than an internal combustion engine. And you can just see that in different cases. And West, I don't mean to pick on West Virginia, but it is a coal state, and that's this tells you basically what's going on. The good news about this is that this kind of research, which is getting done, systems level analysis. And by the way, this counts. Just in case you're wondering, this counts from what's called well to wheel. So it really counts the amount of carbon produced when pumping oil out of the ground, refining it, transporting it to the gas station, pumping it in your car, burning it in your car. It includes all of it. So these kinds of studies are really important. So just making a better battery is not the answer. And I just wanted to show this. The good news is that the people doing this are working closely with China. Uh, an organization called the China Automotive Technology and Research Center, Katark. I've actually visited there. The thing about Qatar is it's one of these Chinese organizations, so it's both a, it's both a, a, a trade organization and a policy-making government organization, so you can remember exactly where they fall. But they're actually starting to think about how do they use this kind of thing uh, to make things work. Now, I do, as I said, this, this is a, uh, this is, I, I'm a physicist, so I'm going to show you one science slide if I can get this important. Because, you know, I figured I'm up here, let me tell you what the future of batteries is, because this is actually, I think, interesting. This is how battery works. The reason I'm showing you this is that this is another multidisciplinary program at Argonne National Labs at the University of Chicago. It's got a bunch of national labs, a bunch of universities, University of Illinois is involved, Northwestern University, Michigan University. Um, building a better battery, trying to build a futuristic battery. And the reason I'm showing this to you is, is because there are tremendous possibilities for batteries. Today, your Tesla is a great car. Now a Tesla can go three or 400 miles, forgetting the cost of that car. If you ever, if you open the trunk of a Tesla, it's a battery. So the, the Tesla is basically a battery with a drive, with a steering wheel and a motor. You really need, if you and I want to all afford, you know, you want to get out to your Volkswagen, you want to get out to a lesser car, you really need a battery that's going to get you three or 400 miles. Maybe in Hawaii, you don't need quite three or 400, you may need 200, so maybe that's a little different. But this is how a battery works. And what's interesting about this thing called the Joint Center for Energy Storage Research, there are economists in it, there are physicists in it, there are engineers in it. And the reason is, let me just give you two things, and I'm going to try to get through this here, but there, there are several things going on here. The way a battery works, you can see there's a lithium, this is a lithium ion battery, you hear lots about them. There are li little ions called lithium, they're singly charged, they have one unit of charge. And th what you're looking at now is this thing is charging, so you plug it into the wall and it's charging. The lithium moves away from a host material, whatever that is, it's a complicated material, into a bunch of shelves, and those shelves are made of carbon, that's just graphite, it's not the kind of carbon you burn. And then they sit there until you plug in or until you start your motor, and you then take the lithium back out and it drives it back the other way. So it's single charge, and they move back and forth. The first way we're going to make a much better battery is to change from lithium to something like magnesium. So it's a different element in the periodic table, and instead of being singly charged, it's doubly charged. So instead of carrying one unit of charge, I double it right there if I can do it. It's hard. I won't go into the details of the science, but that's one thing. That's one very important point. So that's one of the ways we're going to make a better battery. The second which is in some ways more interesting, is devising materials that are not look like a shelf. The shelf is like, if you have a book on a shelf, it's easy to knock it off so you can gain the energy very easily. You really want it to bind in there, chemically bind. You want it to be like you've nailed it into the shelf, so when you pull it out, it takes a lot of energy, or you get a lot of energy. And we're trying to invent new materials. Why do I mention this? New materials are everything as far as energy is concerned. I mention it because we wouldn't do that without having economists look at this thing. Techno-economic modeling, which we've talked about before, if you're going to build a better battery, you better make sure you have the materials on Earth to build it. If you're going to make a billion of these cars, you could say, well, we've got enough lithium. We actually have to be careful. We may have to recycle lithium to really, if we want to power a billion cars. But the other thing about it is, if I just tell, you know, I want to make this out of some bizarre set of materials, companies can't make it. So you need to have techno-economic modeling involved. You need people to cost it out, to make the materials validate materials. So when you think about building a better battery, it sounds, oh, you just have a couple of chemists and physicists standing around. You actually have to have economists, people like like, like Michael. <laughs> you have to have them. So I just wanted to talk a bit about it. I think batteries are very cool. So let me come back to um, this multidisciplinary approach. And I want to mention, how much time do we have? Five minutes or so? OK. So I'm going to just mention one other, really? Um, I'm just going to mention one other thing, which, which I'm very excited about, and I'm going to skim through it because I don't have a lot of time, and that's another form of carbon-free energy, that's nuclear power. And this is one which is very controversial, but I also think is really important. And, uh, and the reason, and there's a lot of lessons we can learn from nuclear power in history. Um, first of all, nuclear power is an important and existing potential source of carbon-free uh, generation. There, there are currently 60 nuclear power plants under construction in the world. 
there are zero right now in the U.S. There were two that closed down because of costs. Twenty of them are in China. China's not going to make up all of their energy needs. It's terawatts. You know, you'd have to build a thousand reactors in about 30 years in China to be able to make it work. They're not going to build a thousand reactors, but they're going to do some of it. But it is extremely expensive to build a reactor in this country. So, and the reason it's expensive is that it's the regulatory barriers, safety issues, uh, and and we haven't figured out how to do it. So I don't have a lot of time to get into detail, but right now. It does remain, just so you know, the only non-emitting source for base load generation that we have, period. It's the only one, so we can say we don't like it. In Illinois, it's, it's in northern Illinois, it's 60% of our energy. 60% of our electricity is nuclear, and it is one of the cheapest. It, we have, we're paying actually nickel uh, a kilowatt hour, actually, in some places in northern Illinois. So nuclear is a very interesting and viable option, and I don't have a lot of time to talk about it, but I do want to say I realize Fukushima and Chernobyl were terrible disasters and have really turned people negatively in a, in, in a reasonable way, but it's also uh, the economic challenges associated with it are the big barrier. But I do want to make one last important point about this, which is when we think about uh, the social costs of carbon, and you're going to hear a lot about this from Michael, when you think about the destruction of property from storms because of carbon, the destruction of property from floods, agriculture, lost productivity, the cost of treating air pollution, I think Michael's organization, Epic, has estimated that there's a cost per ton of carbon of about $50, so there's a real cost to it. And in our country, we're producing about 1.2 million metric tons alone from coal plants, 1.2 billion metric tons a year from coal plants. That's $100 billion in just social cost. So take that number and then say it's too expensive to build. When you take that number and say it's a few billion dollars to build a small nuclear plant, the equation is very different. So my point here is not just let's do the economics. It's that when you think about nuclear, safety issues are important. But when cost becomes the main issue, you have to think twice because there's a much bigger back-end cost to building coal plants than there because we're not charging for the carbon emission into the air. And this is really important. Again, it's a system level or a life cycle analysis of what it really is that you're doing. So let me just finish by saying, um, you know, I'm, I'm going to say energy miracles are expensive, inventing new batteries, building uh, nuclear plants, displacing coal with solar and wind is very expensive. Uh, but in the end, uh, but in the end, it, it, it's this balance between thinking about the overall global cost. You'll hear from Michael probably tomorrow more about the social cost of carbon, and this is a really important way to think about the system level, the system level analysis. As I said, when I was a kid, it was all faster, smaller, cheaper. I'm a scientist, and I believed it was true until I realized it had to be much more complicated than that. Energy is such a big problem, and so these are really the bigger level challenges, bigger challenges, and they're especially when you have 1.2 billion people in this world living without electricity at all, 2.7 billion whose only cooking facilities are, are wood stoves or charcoal stoves or, or crop residues, animal dung. Those are producing a lot of carbon. And, um, and I will say that to give scope to this, one more thing I want to say is to make the transformation to all these new technologies is, is not free. And we, as a country, need to invest the research dollars. We don't, we are actually coming out of that. We're reduced, investing less and less. China is about to invest $360 billion by 2020. That's only three years. By 2020, they're investing over $100 billion a year. I will give you the numbers we're investing. It's on the order of billions. Not, so we're being, we're being, we're being uh, overshadowed by tens of billions of dollars. And this is, all, this is all a big concern. It's not that China shouldn't figure it out. We want them to figure it out. But it also, for us to be able to, to keep these things in mind, we have to invest heavily ourselves. So. So let me just conclude by saying, um, you know, I, I, I started by saying I bristle at the idea of energy miracles and that there's no simple miraculous solution here. You're going to hear it from all of us. This is a very complicated problem. There aren't miracles, but uh, but there and there is no magic technology, right? It's not going to be batteries. It's not going to be although well, batteries are critical. It's not going to be nuclear. It's going to be probably all of the above, which we'll hear about. And everything we come up with will have a cost, both in dollars and in social impacts. And we're thinking about nuclear or coal or, or electrification, we have to think at the system level and we have to think of these social impacts. So I would say that um, I'm not asking for a miracle and I'm not waiting for one. Uh, it will take all of us and in fact a lot of students here. Uh, I started here and I went into my business to try to help transform a little piece of the world with, with energy, with science, and so I'm hoping that maybe after today and after Michael speaks tomorrow you'll get excited and you'll either become an economist and win a Nobel Prize or something. Or you'll, or you'll become a, a scientist and you'll, you'll try to figure out some of these problems. Really to, to come up with some of these smart focus strategies that involve engineers, economists, physicists, all working together. 
and we need all of you to help, so thank you. So I'm going to start out. Uh, you heard about being a scientist or an economist. You can also be a writer. <laughs> and you can actually be a scientist and a writer, or an economist and a writer. Uh, I started writing about climate and humans when they did. Th they had things like magazines, like it was actually paper. <laughs> this is 1985. My first article about the human relationship with the climate system was on was not on global warming. That was dated until 1988. It was on nuclear winter. Um, Cold War was way more intense than it is now, even though it's getting more intense now. Uh, you know, there was a prospect we were going to set a bunch of cities on fire by blowing them up, and um, and some scientists calculated what that would do to the atmosphere using climate models that were already being used to assess global warming. The models were being developed mostly around global warming, climate change, but there were then they were turned to this task. Uh, and a year after, um, well, around the same year I wrote this. Um, more science was applied to the question, and nuclear winter, uh, according to Steve Schneider, one of the great climate scientists who's worked on all these issues for a long time, he and another guy, Starley Thompson, wrote a piece uh, proposing it was more like nuclear autumn. <laughs> like, so where's your headline for nuclear autumn, right? And, and this is why science is, is, um, has delineated very powerfully the basics of this problem, but sometimes more science makes things more complicated, so don't count on there being some magic moment when the IPCC solves this for you by making the issue look just dramatic, even more dramatic than it already is. Um, there are limits to, um, sometimes the more we study things, the more complica complicated they get. And I can talk about that, that's a whole other day. But here, I want to start out with a little bit of optimism, but it's like guarded optimism, okay? So this is 1985. How do you think a science magazine made money in 1985? Well, you turn to the opening page. The most expensive ad, right? <laughs> and the liquor is on the back. <laughs> so, so that changed, right? It was a very long time scale for that to happen. Um, and there was disinformation and misinformation and confusion and addiction. And that mix is very similar to what we have with climate, including the addiction part. You know, we really like fossil fuels. We'd like to say we don't, but I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for a flight on an airplane. And, uh, you know, should I have come? That's an open question. It's an interesting question. Uh, I, this is David Archer at the University of Chicago stopped flying. He's a climate, climate modeler. Stop going places because he's so worried about global warming. So it's, these are interesting times. The issues are not off, often behind the sort of simplistic, you know, denier, believer, warming, solve the problem rhetoric. I think one thing I want to get across is that this is a long-term journey you're on, if you're interested in this issue. This, and I'll, I'll, I'll use Bill McKibben, whose rhetoric is all about urgency, <laughs> to illustrate that point in a couple minutes. Um, some of the issues, uh, I, I, I've been talking lately about the unusual suspects. There was that great movie, The Usual Suspects, but the unusual suspects are not as easy to identify and, and to address. And there are things like scale. The, the wonderful thing about this conference is you pull together the key words here. Scale, as you heard a couple times, a couple minutes ago, is really the villain in the room. It, it, and inertia, this, this system, we have dem demographic inertia alone is driving us toward nine billion people, more or less. Uh, and, and there's not a lot of knobs you can tweak to make a difference there. And we love energy. And, and there's what they call it suppressed demand. That's one of these great economic terms. People, most of the people who are cooking on firewood would way, way, way prefer to be cooking on LPG or, or natural gas or electricity. And when they have those options placed in front of them affordably, they jump at it. But even then, there's complexities that, which I'm trying to write about now for ProPublica. It's uh, driving me a little crazy. Um, but I'm trying. And now this isn't going forward. But, Yeah, I'm trying that. Page up? Oh, wait. Oh, it's down there. Look at that. Slide. You know what? I'll just do it. OK, so um, well, now it's going to wake up. So yeah, most of you know that Paris was a great success because it was a total failure, right? The success was you got roughly 200 countries to agree on something. Now. Now it's just the United States and Syria. 
who are signed on. Uh, Nicaragua finally signed on, so that's it. Syria and the United States. Um, and, and then there was a lot of cheering, and I, I started writing about this issue again before there was a climate, the first climate treaty was 1992. And there's been these, these moments of cheering, um, and there was this great expectation that from, from, 19, from two, uh, 1992 till Copenhagen in 2009, the hope in this process was to come up with some magical kind of top-down template Sort of like when we would pass, a, pass legislation here, you know, the hope for a climate bill was the same thing. Someone will solve this by putting this system on top of us that will tamp down our, our thirst for energy and, and make it all monetizable and tradable. And, um, the Paris, the transition, what happened was Copenhagen was a failure. And, um, but it was also a liberating moment because between 2009, uh, 2000, wait, when was it? 2009, right? and 2015 in Paris, that's when the whole system got rebooted to create a treaty that was uh, implicitly soft. It did not, at that point, it, it abandoned the idea of targets and timetables and its mandatory steps, and it, it became kind of a, an engagement process. It's, a, it's an agreement to, to meet periodically and to pledge change, but on your terms, uh, as you can do it under your national circumstances, and to, to share information. And there's not a punitive thing in the House, even though Trump seemed to think so. Um, and so, so that's the failure is that it doesn't have a mandatory structure. The success is that's the only way forward. The, the world is a diverse place, China, the United States, and India. Just to give you one snapshot, the United States is a 17 ton per person per year country in terms of CO2. And it was over 20 just a few years ago. And India has just come up to two. So the average Indian is a two ton per person per year person. And everyone in this room is a 17 ton per person per year person. And to say that there's some common solution that fit in those two countries is unrealistic. Even though John Kerry at that last treaty meeting in Paris was berating, was trying to strong arm India into tightening its, its, coal, um, its coal agreements. So, so, so softness actually is your friend. Tom Schelling, a great economist who uh, won a Nobel Prize a long time ago, who I, I got to know pretty well. Uh, he turned 100, he just passed away, right? I think he did, yeah. He uh, sort of uh, came up with this idea of soft law, soft diplomacy. What can you do that's not that traditional style with which we have approached most environmental problems? And, and it's kind of interesting. I'm gonna, this, I'm gonna take you past, you saw a really good slide earlier about Paris, the Paris track. But, and this is kind of another, it looks wonky, but it's easy. Um, what was being resolved in Paris was that this is safe. Blue is safe, basically. A bunch of computer, computer models and assessments of climate risks. And if you want to stay on a safe path for climate, you have to have emissions, and this is emissions of greenhouse gases, go down, down, down like that from 2020. This is the Paris only applies to 2030, which is like a blink in an eye. 2030 is next week, basically, in climate speed. And so that, so, and then that would be, uh, it, the different colored bands there were sort of the negotiation, all that stuff, all that Sturm and Drang in Paris was, what, or can we be in the yellow, or are we going to be business as usual, or, and then we settled kind of in the middle, and yay, 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 so that was the platform. But for climate, because of the cumulative nature of the problem, CO2 is a durable greenhouse gas, if, you're not, if you just think you're done here, you're missing the point. And this, um, you heard this a little bit a minute ago. So here, here's, I, I did this, this is a, that's Paris. That's the climate problem. That's safe, that's business as usual. This is 2090, 2100. And that gap has mostly been filled so far with fantasy talk of uh, BECCS, uh, B-E-C-C-S, which is growing a bunch of stuff and burning it in a power plant and capturing the CO2 and putting it in the ground and here's that scale word again, at the scale of billions of tons a year, avoiding like, taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. And it's been hard enough, some of you probably know, right in Illinois, there's the Archer Daniels Midland uh, carbon capture and sequestration project from a, a corn, one of those ethanol plants or something. And that's a million tons a year. The, they did a million tons in a year. That was like a big deal. We're talking about billions of tons. Uh, and it, it requires a scale that's hard to believe. It's something like two India's worth of growing stuff that you would have to do, like to grow stuff. 
take it to a power plant, burn it, capture the CO2, and put it in the ground. And it's just like, and that's how the IPCC panel has calculated, well, we could stay in this safe trajectory to do that. So that means <laughs> that we, I, I, when I wrote about this, I called my piece the reality gap. Because there's a there is a big reality gap in when we think about these problems, partially related to how we think, partially related to even how we set timescales for when we do analysis. It's it's a tough thing. That these little shortcuts here go to pieces I've written. So j.mp. slash reality gap gives you more on that issue. And of course, it, this is the thing that a lot of people who are focused on the climate problem are forgetting sometimes that there's other things that are changing at the same time. Nigeria is changing hugely. High fertility rates in poor countries in Africa mean that this, so this has to happen while Nigeria is heading in a mid-range, a mid-range Nigeria late in the century is 750 million people. That's, a, that's the UN mid-range estimate for Nigeria. And what's happening in Nigeria? Uh, girls are being kidnapped when they go to high school. And that's how, what's the best way to lower fertility rates anywhere? Get a girl through high school. Yeah, or move to a city. Those two things. So that means if you're not, if you're thinking about the climate problem, and you're not thinking about getting girls through high school in Nigeria, and that means if you're not thinking about somehow overcoming Boko Haram, Boko Haram is actually a climate issue on this scale. Or you can put it out of your mind and think it's all about, you know, micro things. Uh, so it's, it is macro. And that's the hard part. It's, you know, this is a big problem. It's on a scale of a century. It took a century to get carbonized. It's going to take a long time to get decarbonized. Uh, and we have to do it when we're still in surge mode. Um, and that can, like, completely bum you out. Or, to me, the, the, the inverse of that is because it's so prismatic and it involves everything from national security, thinking about Boko Haram, to thinking about energy innovation, batteries, to thinking about education, communication, how to, how to um, sell um, a carbon tax in a state, how to maybe build a coalition of states, as Yoram has been trying to do. You know, all that stuff has some role to play in addressing this issue. And, I, and one of the things I think is beneficial, it's been beneficial for me as a journalist to think about, is that this is less about solving a problem. You know, most of our, we approach environmental problems mostly like solve the problem, like it's a broken pipe. And this is about building a new relationship, building a new relationship with the climate system and with energy. And those things take time. You, you're never really done. Uh, I learned a lot from people who, who uh, um, study with uh, best practices, that term best practices in industry. The places where that succeeds is not where it's a number, like, you know, Cut that by 20%. It's where it's a culture where you don't stop. It's like you just keep looking at efficiency or you keep looking at waste or you keep looking at um, how to improve X. And that, that's the, I think it's a, it's a beneficial thing. It, some people would say, well, that's like a cop out because we need to solve this problem and there's people to punish. And, and you know, those, all, all of those are part of it, but they're, this idea of building a relationship with these systems, um, I think, is a beneficial way to think about it. One last thing, and this, it took me a while to learn this, uh, when I started spending more time in developing countries. Um, first in 1989, I wrote a book about the, the Amazon rainforest and uh, the murder of Chico Mendez, who was an um, organizer of rainforest uh, people's uh, land rights and labor guy. And that was the first story I did where I really got to understand that most environmental problems are social problems with environmental impacts. And it's not, it's not like, the environmental, and the environmental issues we look at are symptoms of social issues. And uh, energy, they're, they're, I, you know, I've, I probably use, well, I think between all of us, we probably used the word we, I don't know, 25, 30 times in the last 45 minutes. There is no we, okay? We're all homo sapiens, but um, the two ton per person, person, two ton per year person in rural India, or um, my sister in Manhattan, that's, this is her redone, and she lives, in, she's like the best low carbon person you can imagine. Manhattan is the best low carbon city around because people walk and they use subways and they live in buildings that share heating and cooling, right? So, so that's fantastic. Um, but it's not, 
It's a very different thing than this. I spent time in India recently for the story that I'm closing out on the, the cook stove issue. And this is the best case scenario. These are great. This is this 10-month-old uh, uh, improved cook stove. It doesn't really work very well. And this is LPG, as I said earlier. This is the same woman. She's using both. And this is her kitchen and her outdoor cooking. And it's a complicated scenario. Um, I was with people who spend time every, it's four hours a day just of cooking time, plus getting the fuel and all that stuff. And that, to say that they can't use the fossil fuel because it's a climate problem is really not an ethical thing to... The, find me the ethics there, and that, that's an interesting question to think about. And I, I think I'll stop there. I was going to show a video, but maybe we'll do it at the end, because... Oh, and here's, you know, I interviewed Bill McKibben. Bill, Bill McKib <laughs> I've interviewed Bill McKibben many times. He's a friend. But I interviewed Bill Gates. There's a video on the Times website when I was at the Times for an hour. And um, he does have this more nuanced version of the miracle story. His idea of miracles is, is he has articulated beyond the simple sound by this more, um, a, they aren't magical. Miracles are not magical, just as you heard a minute ago. And it's really important to know that too. If you go to j.mp slash dot gates, you'd find the daughter video I did about him. And Bill McKibben, I'll just say, when I talk to young people, uh, you know, Bill and I have been on the same journey for a long time. We took very different paths. He went into activism, I stayed in journalism. And, but the book about, that he's written that's, that's most applicable to this, the scope of this issue is the one he wrote about long distance skiing. He spent a year learning long distance skiing. His father was ill and he was struggling with a lot of things. And uh, his, his rhetoric is urgent, 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 war, you know, find his war. But his life, look, look at how he lives his life. Basically, he's pursuing this question. It's like what I said about best practices. He gets up every morning and finds something to do that's related to moving the trajectory a little bit towards success, um, even as he speaks about now and, and all that stuff. So I think that's an interesting thing to think about as well. And I think, um, why don't we uh, move to the next phase? Thank you. Uh, it's a great honor to be here uh, this week uh, and tonight, particularly with uh, able to talk with three such distinguished uh, experts on this area. I think my job is to respond. Yeah, in any way. respond in any way I feel moved. Okay, so uh, I had a couple reactions. Uh, I think. Uh, Three really important themes uh, were hit upon. Uh, the first is uh, the central role of policy. Uh, I think that to hope that we're going to run out of fossil fuels or that uh, uh, that suddenly renewables are going to be cheaper by themselves, I think that uh, evidence probably weighs against that. And so that was really important uh, that that was raised. And I think in the absence of federal policy, what states are going to do is a, a key issue. Uh, then Eric talked uh, quite a bit about uh, technology and energy miracles. Uh, and I think uh, I really enjoyed, and I, I just want to underscore, do it on the blackboard, but I, I want to underscore Eric's focus on the battery. Uh, I think any path that one has in mind about climate kind of runs through the battery. Uh, that can be through the grid, uh, getting the renewables uh, to deal with their intermittency, and then also there have to be improvements so that someone wants to buy an electric vehicle. Uh, and I think uh, until the batteries start to come down, it's going to be very hard to sell a lot of uh, electric vehicles. Uh, and then I, I, I like Andy's discussion of uh, the politics, the policy, and, and the no we. So if I was to take issue, though, with uh, one uh, uh, a theme that I thought came across uh, is I don't think it's really a climate problem. Uh, I think it's like an energy challenge problem. Uh, and there's very legitimate goals uh, that I think are besides uh, reducing carbon. And then I'll talk a lot about that tomorrow night. Uh, but, uh, you know, I see the energy challenge as really having three prongs. Uh, and those prongs are how do we get access to inexpensive and reliable energy that's critical for increasing living standards. Uh, and, you know, when I think about that, uh, it's not, it's very difficult to stop thinking about the state of Bihar in India, uh, where per capita electricity consumption is about 130 kilowatt hours uh, per person per year. In the United States, it's 13,000. Uh, 
so they're off by two zeros. Uh, you know, and the second goal, I think, uh, of the global energy challenge is how do you address the pollution uh, that is part of the fossil fuels that we use? Uh, and uh, that pollution shortens lives. Uh, I have some new research suggesting in northern China, uh, air pollution is reducing life expectancies uh, by several years. It's true in India, it's true in many parts of the world, and that's part, that's part and parcel of using uh, the fossil fuels. Uh, and then, you know, third, and I don't mean to say it's uh, less important, uh, is, you know, how do you achieve those goals of managing the health problems, having access to inexpensive and reliable energy, while also uh, confronting the climate challenge, which was uh, what the focus of the conversation was about. Uh, and I think trying to, what's com so complicated, and I think interesting about this problem, uh, is that it involves really tough trade-offs and societal choices that are reflection of values and uh, reflection of economics uh, and uh, not easily bendable to trying to go at one goal. Uh, and so I think that's probably what I think is uh, the most important uh, part of this challenge is how do we find uh, ways to, as a world, come together on this. And what in Andy's last slide it makes it especially tough is that there is no we. Uh, uh, the way we see the problem is incredibly different than the way uh, people in India see the problem, who are desperate for energy, uh, and it's very different than the way people in China see the problem, who are, you know, choking on uh, high levels of air pollution. So, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, as an economist, I think there are some easy solutions that would help a great deal, which would be uh, to price energy so that it reflects its full cost, it reflects the pollution, it reflects the carbon. I think that would go a long way towards helping find the right balance. Uh, and I think also investment in innovation, uh, be it in the kind of innovation that Eric was suggesting is necessary for batteries, that's going to be very important. Uh, and I think also a great role for uh, government. But I, I guess if I could, you know, had one complaint, it would be to kind of shift the conversation away from climate is the only problem. Uh, to it's a really complex problem with at least three goals uh, and trying to figure out the best way to trade off those goals is one that uh, there's economics can lend insight to but uh, ultimately is going to reflect also values and uh, culture and things that I think people are less comfortable analyzing. So that was my reaction. As a, as a uh, renewable energy source, what do you, do you think using um, like larger rivers, like for example the Mississippi, would be uh, would be um, viable? Would be viable for cost-effective energy? Hydroelectric is a very interesting, uh, a very interesting uh, a source of obviously almost almost carbon free, other than the manufacturing of a lot of concrete and all that. Um, if you look around the world, there is still a lot of room for growth in 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 hydro, but it's not. It, it, you're not going to see ten times more hydro. So right now, I mean, cities like LA actually do quite a bit of hydro. I think California has I don't know if it's ten percent of their power is what they call large hydro. But, uh, but by and large, you could do the Mississippi. Of course, there's a cost to doing the Mississippi because it's all, you're basically going to have to flood a lot of agricultural lands, residential lands. So I think there are real issues with just flooding any river you want. But the, the, the bottom line is you can do some of it, you know, using gravity as your source of energy. But in the end, there is not, you can do it, but there's just not enough there. Much of that kind of uh, uh, advantage has already been taken in this country. Quite a bit of it has. I don't know the exact numbers. I don't know. Maybe Andy knows the exact numbers, but it's it's uh, it's it's not the same growth business that many of the other types of, of low carbon energy is. I'll just say briefly, um, yeah, and then there are places like in uh, sub-Saharan Africa. There's various mega dam proposals, but they run into all kinds of issues. Uh, the financing is an issue in countries with, with the governance is not secure. And then there's the displacement of people, which has been a huge issue in Brazil and uh, India and elsewhere. Uh, so 
you do have trade-offs. <laughs> trade-offs, trade-offs, trade-offs. And, and I have seen, I have, don't know the numbers, but the, it's pretty maxed out, for the rivers that can give us um, substantial hydro. New York State is going to be relying more on, on Quebec hydro as it tries to pursue its uh, decarbonization plan. But the, and that's something that Bobby Kennedy Jr. used to fight ferociously was Quebec hydro because of uh, Native Canadian issues, uh, rights issues. So it's all kind of a mashup. Other questions? Yeah. Um, one of you mentioned that a third of the capacity in the past year was solar and other renewables. Um, and then another mentioned that most of the population growth in the next couple of decades is coming in sub Saharan Africa. So how does um, so if like would it be okay then if you know mo if most of the new capacity is you know renewable? Yeah, I think the the that people make those two observations. The, a lot of the growth is going to come in today's developing countries, and a lot of those developing countries are in very sunny places. Uh, I think until, uh, uh, so first of all, it's still not very, it's still pretty expensive. A, uh, B, until the intermittency problem is uh, solved, which is Eric's battery problem, uh, I think it's not, it, these kind of microgrids that people have in mind are never going to deliver uh, the reliability uh, that people like. You know, they want to be able to count when they split the switch as the lights come on. So I think there's opportunity there, but I think uh, there needs to be a lot more technical progress before it can really be a major player. People in, in those countries often the reply is, you know, no, we want real electricity. The, the one, I would add to this, and maybe this is directing a question that you might, because one, there's also the, the um, industrial, call it, maybe it's a more cynical statement, industrial complex. I mean, China cranks out coal plants all the time. They're not building them in China. They'd love to sell them everywhere else. So there's a lot of pressure on the companies themselves to get out. I mean, China's bought a lot of the grids, actually, as you may know, in Africa, not a lot, but some number of grids. They're happy to put carbon in. I shouldn't say happy, but they, they have big companies generating coal plants. They're stamping them out. And so they're looking for places to keep their own industry going. So this it gets back to this point. There's trade-offs, there's complexities, there's a lot of things going on at once. Uh, which drive behavior. It's not just your logical statement, which is a lot of sun. They need to grow. Why not? In your talk, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Yeah. In your talk on Hawaii, you mentioned how there were issues with selling back electricity. Why was that an issue for Hawaii? Okay, so um, it was called a net metering program, and what it did was um, if you generated electricity, you could sell it back to the utility at retail rates. And so that meant that where was the utility going to make its money? So the utility, which is used to making money, and they need to make money because they are financing, they've got all kinds of... ...using up a large fraction of our energy, so there's an inextricable link. So you may be right in general, but then, but you know, and uh, I just want to put in one, one I, I disavow smaller, faster, cheaper, but I want to come back to that because all of what you're saying is right. Fossil fuel is bad. Everything else is good. Uh, there, there, and, and I'll come back to this word miracle. There, there are opportunities and possibilities where you will see great breakthroughs in science. I mean, the one I mentioned on solar cells. If you really make solar cells that are ten times cheaper, and just think of your phone, what you're carrying around inside your cell phone. It's, uh, you know, it's only co it only cost you 800 bucks to buy it. But that, that $800 would have been, would have probably been $50,000 if you tried to buy something with equal power and much bigger 20 years ago. And so when you do think about the march of technology, it, it can be transformative. And there are these black swan events where you get something that's really transformative. Solar cells are one of them. Wind is not going to be that way because wind is kind of, we're getting what we can out of it. We'll improve them. We'll, we'll do them because it's fairly old technology, these wind turbines. But there are technologies, whether it's in creating fuels that are bio, you know, biofuels, renewable fuels, that could very well. And, you know, I see people working on it all the time. You know, these are the kinds of things that are going on. So I'm not praying for a miracle, but I'm looking at, at progress. And sometimes you do get, a, 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 you know, a, theta, a jump in, in technology, which makes, which could make some of these alternative approaches cheaper than coal. Can I just add to that? I think uh, one thing that I would add uh, is 
the technological advances are not only occurring uh, in the low carbon energy sources. That's right. uh, there's a lot of really smart guys working at Schlumberger and working at Exxon. <clears throat> and in fact, we have the fracking revolution. We have we can thank them for that. <clears throat> and it was those guys are not sitting around uh, doing nothing. And so it is part of the reason that I think uh, I think without the robust policy. We are really <clears throat> stacking the deck against ourselves with respect to climate. But that does get back into the social and political science of how you generate policy. And um, I, I actually, let me let me show this thing. Okay? I think it's worthwhile. <laughs> and because this shows you that uh, even in the time of even in the time we're in, <laughs> I won't give it a name. You can find common ground with people if you if you communicate with them. So just to set this up, there's a guy named John Sutter who's a journalist who was at CNN, young guy, who traveled around, the country, traveled around the world in 2015 doing a series called Two Degrees. He went all over the place, ahead uh, of Paris. And he, uh, Yale University and another university had done this study at the, at the state level, looking at all 50 states, they looked at data and surveys and about what you believe about climate change and, and relate, related issues. It turns out that, that Woodward County, Oklahoma, is the most skeptical county in America when it comes to global warming. So that he went there and just had a bunch of conversations with people. And it's just three minutes. And depending on your points of view on things, the first three, the first minute will make you crazy. But then just listen, okay? It's worth it. I'm not a real, a real firm believer in, uh, in climate change. He said, I'm not a firm believer. What's your view of climate change? Like, do you, do you think it's a real thing or not? I'd say it's something that I, I don't think I've really thought a lot about. And I don't think it's something that gets talked a lot about here around Woodward. They don't talk about climate change, but every single day they talk about the weather. High of 104 to 106 is the forecast high. We have firestorms, we have ice storms, we have tornadoes, we have blizzards. We don't really reference the the climate change word as much out here. We'll have a heat index of 110 to 115, which is very, very dangerous. But they address it and how the weather impacts them. Oil and gas is king in this country, in this state, and no one wants anything that's going to hamper the oil and gas industry. I used to be full-time in the oil field. Well, I'm employed in the oil field. I'm uh, an oil and gas company. If there's no oil field, there's no jobs. Our whole economy runs on fossil fuels. Is there a time that we'll go away from fossil fuel? Yes, it is not a renewable resource. We as human beings have a tendency to put put off what we really need to do if it, if it has the capacity to make us uncomfortable. Al Gore is, is, a, is a cuss word. I go back to Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth. We tend to be very conservative. I've not seen the film, but I've seen bits and pieces. We tend to not always trust everything that comes out of the media's mouth. Whenever you hit a crossroads of fact-finding, then you tend to fall in line with the people who you believe in other political arenas. I don't know who I would trust. There's got to be people we believe, we trust, that get behind this cause and say, this is an issue. And then I think you will see people get on board in droves. I just figured that, uh, you know, the good Lord's gonna, he's the only one that, that, that knows, you know. I'm not saying the environment is perfect today because God openly controls the environment. And maybe we shouldn't interfere with it. God speaks directly to issues out of his scripture. And when he said in Genesis, be good stewards of this land and take care of it. That has value always. God does talk about us taking care of what he's given us. Christians should be the original tree huggers. I mean, uh, we think it's a moral issue to take care of the planet. We've gone solar, most people I know, most of my family. We're gonna to try to have a solar system big enough to supply all the needs of our house. The old people know like what we did in the Dust Bowl, like my grandpa talks about how they knew that they caused it because they plowed the earth so much. There would be periods when the sun would be blotted from out. I think older people can look back and see how things were generations ago. Yeah, we ought to be on the same path. We're just fighting over rhetoric. I completely agree that if it is an issue, and there's plenty of evidence that it is, that we have a responsibility to do something. If we don't do something now, I think it's just going to get worse. Being a part of this has made me more curious to study more and find out if there's something that I can do personally. Everybody will go out and be good stewards. 
and realize that God has given us this planet and we should take care of it, then I think we'll be in good shape. So, what, I mean, there's so much that's interesting there. But the, the main the part that, two little things. The woman, the, the last woman who said, you know, being part of this was made me want to find out more. So engagement is a way to learning. And of course, the guy, the guy with the tie, if you go to the website, I, I wrote about this on Dot Earth a couple of years ago. Just, just Google for Sutter Woodward Lyman, and you'll find it. He did a whole long interview with the, the oil company guy. And, and he's a libertarian. He would never vote for Hillary Clinton or anybody remotely who wants to command and control his life. But he also doesn't want to be beholden to utility. So his, his passion for getting off the grid is about freedom not about climate. So, but you can cut him out of the conversation completely if you go into that town and want to defeat him or make him believe what you believe about climate science. And I've been writing about climate for, you know, as a journalist all this time, and it was hard for me to start to understand. Sometimes it makes sense not to make it the front, the front line issue. Um, I'm, I'm just going to say one thing here about, is this on? Okay. Um, there's so many, so many issues here, but one thing is, I think I agree with you about that climate is not the issue. It's, um, there are so many aspects of it and we've bundled everything into this climate change thing. And just looking at global policies, when I was looking at um, why something called uh, the Montreal Protocol, which specifically focused on chlorofluorocarbons and the ozone hole, uh, why that was more successful than something like the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change or the Kyoto Protocol, which deals with all the greenhouse gases, all the world's evils. I mean, that's going to be harder to address. And I think we really need to be looking at it with specific slices of things like health. So pollution, you know, what does that mean for health? What does that mean for, um, for the miners who are, who are, who've got 40,000 deaths a year from coal mining? Um, and coal-related deaths. So, you know, I think we really need to be looking at it more specifically, and maybe with even having sort of just a, just a, you know, a carbon dioxide treaty or a, you know, something like that, and just breaking it up. And because when you when you listen to people, even even some of the people I work with, they say things like, "Well, you're not one of those climate believers, are you?" I have to say, "It's okay. I'm just a researcher. I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not a not a priest or a." someone trying to shove this down your throat. So it's become almost like a religion that is polarizing people. And really in Hawaii, for one thing, one thing that we're looking at is climate adaptation. So, you know, we're really susceptible to sea level rise. We're really susceptible to hurricanes. Uh, there have been more hurricane events in Hawaii this year and last year than ever before. And um, we're, we're very cognizant of what's happened in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico, is not that far away from the United States mainland, but Hawaii is. It's about 2,000 miles away, and it will be, it'll be months before we get any relief from there. So, so you know, we're, I mean, we're only a million and a half people living there, but I think it's a good test case to figure out is there something that um, that we can all do at the local level, and that's where again is the lesson of Hawaii. Can I ask a question of the economist. So, because uh, I think this point's a good one, right? Thank you. Thanks. Breaking, breaking it down to uh, <laughs> <of our> yours. <laughs> breaking it down to a, a single issue, and, you know. So the the one that always r reminds me that it can be done is the sulfur dioxide problem, acid rain, mm -hmm. and and you know there, there we talked about it at dinner. I mean there. Uh, a few very clever people created a market around, you know, basically a trade, right? And said, you know, if you want to make, you know, if you want to produce more, you have to pay into this, you know, and then I'll produce less, and, uh, you know, make it into an exchange. And so why can't, I mean, so it's cap and trade, I know there's bad words behind it, but it worked. And it worked, I mean, there, there, was, there was tangible, tangible damage done in the Northeast, in, you know, dead fish and trees that were falling apart. Why can't something, so from an economy, this, this for example is a policy, it's a very clear economic policy that seems to have worked very effectively. It's essentially eliminated. Uh, yeah, so, so why something like that can't work? So I think, uh, so let's break that into pieces. Okay. I think the first question is, why can't something like that work in the United States? Yes. Uh, and uh, I think part of what makes the climate problem so complicated uh, is uh, that sulfur dioxide damage is occurring right in front of people's eyes in real time. 
a lot of the damages from climate change are occur far into the future. Uh, so that, I think that's one thing to make sure uh, The second thing is that when a ton of CO2 is released into the atmosphere, it causes <coughs> damages anywhere, or all over the world. Uh, and so the benefits of that policy necessarily, if you have a very kind of, let's just call America first view, uh, the benefits of that policy are going to be dispersed outside of the US borders. And so I, I, I think that's complicated. Uh, I think probably, I think both of those things can be overcome. What I think is the hardest thing is the very different ways that the climate problem uh, uh, is seen around the world. Uh, and, you know, it looks very, very different if you're sitting in India or if you're sitting in China than it, than it does here. I mean, in those countries, you have people today, not in 2040 or not in 2050, basically dying of low consumption or and to ask them to buy electricity is two or three, you know, whatever the Hawaii prices are, two or three times the price uh, that they could purchase it for, is asking them to take more, uh, you know, continued harder life today, uh, and, uh, post, you know, in exchange for some benefits uh, in the future when they're likely to be much richer than they are today. Uh, and I think that, I think that makes it very complicated internationally, and then that probably feeds into the domestic conversation as well. As you know, well, why should we do it if China and India aren't going to do it? So please join me in thanking them.